Once again today we greet you in the name of Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. It's good to see you here in the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church today. We appreciate your presence. You that's listening out in the radio listening audience most certainly appreciate you tuning in to Northside Baptist Church Hour. If you get on your phone out there and call a friend, you do them a favor. Received a letter last week from a dear lady up in uh, around Hawassi, Georgia. Young Harris, I believe. Young Harris, Georgia. And she was 91, I believe she said, and took care of her own uh, housework and worked in the yards and always looked forward to the radio broadcast. Well, we appreciate that. You never know who's listening. I'm hoping today we can be a blessing to everyone. Now, this is Preacher Edward speaking. Take your Bible and turn to Hebrews chapter 9 for the reading of God's Word. The power of the blood of Christ be tape number 345. If you'd like to write in and get the tape. When you're writing in, you might want to write in and get a list of our tape. We'll send you a list of about 340. And if you'd like to have uh, the book on the 52 7 point outlines on the Holy Spirit, they're still available. For a gift of four dollars, we'll mail you this book. On the back, you see a picture of me and my wife. And uh, then, of course, there's Brother David Lewis's great book on the Song of Solomon. I gave a preacher one a couple of weeks ago, and saw him shortly after that, just a matter of hours. I said, "Preacher, had have you looked over that book?" He said, "Man, I done gone through half of it." So I like that, and it's a great book. The Song of Solomon by David Lewis. It's a masterpiece. And uh, whenever you write in for the book on the Holy Spirit, you don't have to write the book on the Holy Spirit. Just write in and send a gift for his book, and he'll mail it to you. And he mailed it to my address, and we'll see that he gets the information. You turn to Hebrews 9. Let me say one other word while you're turning there. You know, school is soon starting here at the university. Students coming in, other schools starting. And these people coming in, if they don't have a church home, you get a chance to invite them to come and be in our church services. Be glad to have them. We want to invite all we can in. We want to work real hard and try to build up our attendance. It's going to take us all to do it. And I hope that you'll really work to do so. Now, you in the radio listen audience, if you're not getting our daily broadcast, you tune in to this station where you're now listening at 12 o'clock noon. You can get it Monday through uh, Saturday. And if God permits us to broadcast through Wednesday, that will complete some 40 years of daily broadcasting the gospel of Jesus from the classic city of Athens. I could stand here and take the entire hour telling you about some very unusual things that God's done through this ministry, but I won't try to do that. I wonder how many people we have here in the auditorium. You remember when we went on the air, I was pastor at that time at Calvary Baptist. We just started that church out there. You remember when we went on the air uh, 40 years ago. Would you raise your hands? We have some that remember that. God bless you. God bless you. Well, we have a few. Really do. And you know we have a few people that's helped us all along since that time. Sister Thomaston back there, her husband's gone on to be with the Lord. They have helped us all these years to help keep the program on the air. And others have done it. I'm talking about the ones that's helped from the very beginning. Time we went on the air. When we went on the air, we took some pledges of people that contributed a dollar a week to help us pay for the time. I think it's $64 a week at that time. I was on 30 minutes a day. And we had a few to pledge, and then we expected others to help take care of the work. And some of those few that pledged, some two or three, are still standing by that pledge. And I, I certainly appreciate that. We have at least one here today that's doing maybe two. Uh, Ain't Essie back there? I believe is one of them. And Sister Essie Bullock and Sister Thomaston, and then. Uh, Sister Trixie Williams, she's not here today, may be listening. Those three I know that's helped us right on through the years, a little each week, to take care of the radio broadcast, a month or however God laid on their heart. Now it may be, since it's a 40-year anniversary coming up, 
for our radio ministry. We have a few each year, sometimes three or four. Uh, give us a gift for, of a dollar for each year. We've been on the air to do it so far, and there may be others that like to. I make a contribution of a dollar for each year we've been on the air. And in that way, that helps us out tremendously. You never know who's listening. I was talking to Ethel Vaughn. Ethel Vaughn, uh, Ethel and Vaughn and Ben, they uh, own and operate the uh, Mayflower Restaurant out here on Broad Street just across from the University of Georgia. Their son, Rick, and his wife works with them there. And I was talking to Ethel some two or three weeks ago, and she said, Preacher, I listen to that program Every every Sunday, I believe she said, and when I have a chance, she said it's always a blessing, and uh, I'm glad about that. They have a great restaurant there, uh, the uh, Mayflower, and it's one of the cleanest restaurants you'll find anywhere. You won't find one any more cleaner than that one. You may find some equal to it, and they're always nice and courteous and a wonderful place to go in for a meal at the Mayflower on Broad Street, just across from the university. And I appreciate it. You never know who's listening. I run into people every day that say, Preacher, we listen to your broadcast. My mother listened to your broadcast. Had them tell me that yesterday. What I'm trying to do is drive home to you the real value of this ministry and let you see uh, what a valuable opportunity we have from Northside. Now, this ministry is part of Northside. It's the arm of Northside. And what an opportunity we have to get the gospel out, to do a home mission work to the glory of God. And you that pray for us, to stand by us, and make it possible, most certainly God keeps the record of it. All right, Hebrews chapter 9 my mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia. 30603 is the zip code number. And you write to me. I appreciate it. Now verse 11. But Christ being come a high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is to say not of this building, Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of a testor. For a testament is of force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testor liveth. Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of uh, calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. More we sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle, all the vessels of the ministry, almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. Now in modern hymnals today and these new translations of the Bible, they're taking the blood out. Everywhere they can, they're taking it out because they don't believe in the infallibility of this book. They don't believe in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. They don't believe in the atoning blood of the Lamb, and therefore they're removing it from the hymnals. Now you go to some of these big shot denominational churches today and look at their hymnals and see how many times you find songs about the blood. You take these modern translations of the Bible today, good news for modern man, the RSV and all these modern translations, and look what they've done to the blood. See, uh, Satan's behind all of these new translations of the Bible. You better believe that. Just the other day I saw him 
interviewing an old goat up in New York. Uh, maybe he looked more like a jackass to me. He was, had his collar turned around and called himself a minister. And he looked like a, a donkey looking over a white fence, uh, bellowing for his mama. And they asked him, what do you thought about this blasphemous film called The Last Temptation of Christ? He said, he didn't see anything wrong with it. He said, people want to go see it, it's all right. If it didn't, it's all right. See, that man is out of the bowels of hell. God didn't call that man to preach. And all those fellows that promoted that film and, and uh, of course, uh, had any part in it and produced it, they're out of the bowels of hell. They're Bruce Beast born to be destroyed. They're twice the child of Satan and they're going to hell and they'll burn. Those people will burn. They'll suffer far more than the average cusser out here. I would not want to be in the shoes of these men that had anything to do with that ungodly blasphemous film at all over in England. They have a law over there that uh, you can't show anything that's blasphemy and the deed is over there. So the devils here in America sent that film over there to be shown, and the clergy, probably with the collars turned back as they all met and uh, go and discuss whether or not it's blasphemous, and they had a meeting, and all that gang of preachers over there, the clergymen, not God's men, none of God's men in that crowd, but a bunch of preachers, and they viewed the film. They all agreed it was not blasphemous. It's all right to go ahead and show it. Why, well, those devils don't know what blasphemy is. If that's not blasphemy, then you might as well forget about the word. Take your dictionary and, and check on the word blasphemy. If, if that film is not blasphemy, then we just don't have any blasphemy. Those blinded rascals over there, blinded by religion, don't know anything about God. Uh, they, they don't know the difference of, between blasphemy or any other thing. They know nothing about God. And you, you listen to me, whether you like this or not, any man that calls himself a preacher, that puts his approval on that blasphemous film, you can mark that man down. Now you listen to me, you can mark it down. He is put in the ministry by the devil. He is Satan's ministry. No man of God would ever condone that film. Every man of God that's got God in him would be against that film. And the thing is coming to Atlanta now. They'll drag that, that mess into Athens one of these days. And don't you buy a ticket to go see that film on the last temptation of Jesus. If you do, you're guilty to a certain extent giving them money. And that's what that thing's all about. And you're passing the money on to them. I wouldn't buy a ticket. I wouldn't go see it if it let me see it free. I just wouldn't do it. And if you are a Christian and you buy a ticket to see it, shame on you. You're having a part in it. And if you don't go get out on your knees and confess your sins to God and ask God to forgive you, shame on you, whether you like it or not. No God called preacher to ever buy a ticket and go see it unless he went to get some information to expose it. And that's the only reason he didn't go. I heard a preacher say he did that because he wanted to expose the thing. He couldn't understand it. He couldn't understand it. He wanted to vomit. But he tried to see what it was about so he could expose the thing. Well, I'm not going to do that. Now the blood of Christ is a propitiation for sin. Number one. Romans chapter 3 verse 25. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. Declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Now the Bible declares that we're all sin and guilty before God and the blood of Jesus Christ is a propitiation for our sins. Now the wrath of God fell on Jesus and he fell on Jesus uh, for because he paid our sin debt, not that he had sinned. Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 5, For we all like sheep have gone astray, we turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of, all, of us all. He is our Passover. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, Christ is our Passover. And in John, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 2, and he is the propitiation for our sins, and not ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Now that's why he shed his blood. Not that he had sinned or done anything wrong. He that owed no debt came and paid a debt for us that we couldn't pay. He paid the sin debt. Secondly, 
Through His blood we have redemption and forgiveness of sins. Apart from the blood of Jesus Christ, there's no redemption. There's no pardon from your sins apart from that blood. In Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. That word redemption means to buy or to purchase. And it's through the blood of Jesus Christ that God bought us, He purchased us, He paid the sin debt. That we might have God's peace, God made peace for us. There's a woman on a dying bed one time, the pastor came and said to her, said, A lady, do you have peace with God? She said, No. Uh, you mean to tell me you're on your dying bed and you don't have peace with God? She said, No, sir. Well, said, now, how do you feel about this? You're about ready to leave the world. You tell me you don't have peace with God. She said, now, now, God had made peace for me. He is my peace. And God made the peace for me. Well, that sounds better, doesn't it? God can make peace for you. He certainly can and take care of that situation. In Colossians chapter 1 and verse 20, And having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself. And so we see then that the Bible tells us that it's the blood of Jesus Christ that God Almighty used His own blood to redeem and to give forgiveness of sins, a pardon from our sins. Number three, the blood makes possible fellowship. Now you couldn't have fellowship without the blood. I couldn't go out here and fellowship with a bunch of liberals and infidels that deny the blood of Jesus. I can't go out here and have fellowship with that ungodly crowd that's, that's promoting that terrible blasphemous film. I couldn't have fellowship with that bunch of devils. You can have fellowship with that uh, crowd. But the blood makes possible fellowship. In 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7, if we walk in the light, as He's the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. That great evangelist, Charles G. Finney, many years ago, was having a meeting, and some man came down to close the service and said to him, said, uh, I want to speak to you. Would you go down to my home and let me have a word with you? And he, Finney said, I can't go tonight. Could I go tomorrow night? He said, uh, yes, I'll be here tomorrow night, and I want you to go with me to my home, and we'll. Uh, uh, I want to talk with you about something. The pastor overheard the conversation, and after the service, he warned Finney. He said, Finney, don't go down there. He said, that man's got bloody hands. He's killed people. He runs again and dive in a liquor joint, and, and he's mean. He's ungodly. He's a murderer. And he gets away with it. Said he hates preachers. He hates God. He hates the Bible. Said don't you go down there. And Finney said if he comes here tomorrow night. Sir I'll be going. He said alright I'm warning you. Next night he was there at the end of the service. The man said I'm here. You ready to go? He said I'm ready to go. They went down into this area. And in a darkened area. Where they have beer saloons. Wine, liquor, gambling dives. All kind of uh, uh, ill places. And so he turned into a little dark ho home there, and he said, this is where I live. And uh, Finney walked on in with him, had a lamp on the table there, and uh, and when the man walked in, he said, uh, Mr. Finney, he said, yes, sir. He said, I want you to know that I've committed a lot of sins. Finney said, well, the blood of Jesus Christ take care of that. He said, I want you to know that I've seen people come into my dive and lose their money and go out and commit suicide rather than go home. He said, well, God forgive you for that. He said, I'd have you to know that I set those uh, uh, gambling machines up so a man couldn't win, he'd have to lose. And I've taken many of a poor man's money and sent him home without the money for his family. He said, well, God forgive you, forgive you for that. He said, not only that, I have a wife and daughter lives upstairs here. And they're scared of me, and I whipped them both many times, and said many times they run hide when I go up there. Said I've been awful cruel to them. He said, no, "How about that?" He said, "Well, God forgive you for that." And then he reached down and got a gun off the table. Well, Finney didn't know what he's going to do with that gun, but he said, to "Mr. Finney, you see this gun? Yes. See this finger? Yes." He said, "This finger has pulled the trigger on this gun to kill." More than one man in cold-blooded murder. 
said, would, would God uh, forgive me of that? Charles G. Finney said, listen to me, man. God's blood will cleanse you from that. He said, if you know a God that can take care of all these things, I want to know him. Finney got his Bible out to got down on his knees. And there he led that man to God. Then he said, I want you to go upstairs with me and speak to my wife and daughter. And they went upstairs and the wife and daughter had hid. But when he went in the room, he said, no need to fear my wife, my daughter. I'm a different man. I have a preacher here with me. He wants to tell you something. And so his wife and daughter came out of hiding and, and he told them that God had saved him. And the preacher said, yes, God has saved your husband. He's been saved by the blood of Christ. He put his arms around his little trembling daughter and his wife and asked forgiveness and said, from here on, you're going to have a different daddy. You're going to have a Christian daddy. And so um, the story goes that he'd done away with his gambling dive, turned it into a prayer room and turned it into a Bible study room. And there they had prayer meetings, had services, and many people come to know God. You know, God can do wonders, can't he? He surely can. And it's the blood of Jesus Christ that does that. There's a woman one time that had a, uh, she was a real devoted Christian. She loved God with all of her heart. Wanted to go to church, had one of the meanest husbands that walked in shoe leather. He fussed on her, whipped her, or didn't want to go to church, deprived of the necessities of life, and very, very mean. And the pastor said, I'll tell you what let's do. Let's agree together. God will take care of that jaybird. And she says, are you willing to pay the price for whatever it takes for God to take care of him? She said, yes, I am. I'd like to see him saved. And he said, let's just pray that God will take care of him. That would be all right. It would be all right. They got out and prayed. In a very short period of time, God killed that man. He went on to hell. And that he had a good deal of insurance. And she collected his insurance and married a fine Christian gentleman. And they moved out in Florida and lived a wonderful life down there. God killed that devil and gave her a good Christian husband. There's a deacon one time. You know, a deacon has an important position in the church, and he's honored, and he's going to get a special reward. And God demands and requires that a deacon's wife work with him, be in subjection to him, and obey him, and work with him in serving God. And she'd be rewarded along with him if she works with him. But this deacon's wife would rebel and act a fool, wouldn't work with her husband, fussed him, quarreled at him, didn't much want to go to church, wouldn't go along. And uh, the preacher was burdened about it, the deacon's burdened about it. He knew he was a deacon in the church. church had a confidence in him. He was responsible uh, for his position in the church, and he was doing a good work for God. And the preacher said, are you willing for this thing to be settled? He said, I'm willing. Got out on their knees. He said, now, dear Lord, this man's a good deacon. This church is a... Uh, Called him in as a deacon, and his pastor had confidence in him, doing a good work. Laid up treasures in heaven, but he has a wife is high-tempered and mean as the devil, fuss and quarrels, and acts a fool, and, and don't cooperate with him, don't do what's right. I said, uh, uh, Lord, we're going to turn her over to you. He's willing to pay the price, whatever it takes. And so they prayed for God to take care of the situation. Said, Amen. Short while. God put her in a hole in the ground. That deacon married a good woman that worked with him and served God with him the rest of his days. Now, beloved, you can't play around about this business and serving God. The blood of Jesus Christ can take care of a lot of things. Amen? Amen. Come on, talk back to this Baptist preacher. Amen. Amen. Amen? All right, that's fine. And so we find the blood of Christ justifies. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 9, much more then being now justified by his blood... We should be saved from wrath through him. Now the blood of Christ presents you before God just as though you had never committed a sin. Though you never committed, the blood does that. I don't care how much you've cussed and how much you've stolen and whatever you've done. When you come to know Jesus Christ, God sees you as though you'd never committed a sin in your life. Though we have a great God, it's the blood that does that. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And so God made him, Jesus, to be sin for us. He came and paid a debt he didn't know. First poor sinners that had a debt we couldn't pay. And that's why he came. We justified, he cleared it all. He cleared the debt up. And that's what he does. God clears your debt before God. 
You're indebted to God. The wage of sin is death. It's waiting on you. But Jesus, can, can He can clear that debt up. He can bring you before God as though you'd never committed to sin. And everything is wonderful. That's what He wants to do. Number five, the blood of Christ cleanses our conscience from dead works. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 14 tells you about that. That you might serve a living God. Now, the dead works he's talking about there is, of course, the offering of goats and bulls and heifers and Old Testament rituals and so forth. And so when Jesus came, uh, he cleared everything up. The man could stand before God and be just. Now, their conscience bothered them. They wondered, well, will this goat take care of my sin? Will the goat of that sheep take care of my sin? And so forth and so on. And year after year, they had to do that. The high priest did, and I won't have time to go into all of that. But when Jesus came and shed his blood, that cleared the conscience of all the people in respect to their position before God. You know, a lot of people, the Bible tells us we're all a priesthood. You're a priest, and I'm a priest. We're all a priesthood. And if we're all a priesthood, then why should we go to a minister or a rabbi or a priest or whatnot and stick our nose in a knot in a wall and confess our sins to some man and let the devil get in on it. Beloved, no man can accept your sins and forgive you of your sins, whether it be a Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, Episcopalian, Catholic, or uh, whatever. No man can forgive you of your sins. You are a priest. If you're a child of God, then you're a priest. And you need to come to God yourself and talk to God. Jesus provided that means whenever he died and rent the veil from the top to the bottom. And when Jesus said, now what you need to do as a Christian, don't run to some jack leg preacher. Don't run out here to some fellow passing through claim to be a great religious leader. Don't run out here to some rabbi or a pastor or a minister or a priest or a cardinal or whatever and uh, get out and confess your sins to that gang. That, that's foolish. That's foolish. Jesus said for you to go into your closet and shut the door. Right. Confess your sins to God. Amen. You don't have to confess your sins to any man. You're a high priest yourself and you confess your sins to God. Now, if you want to go to your pastor and sit down and say, Pastor, I have a problem I want you to pray with me about it. God will help me. If you want to tell him about it, all right. If you don't, all right. That's be between you and him. And he'll pray with you about it. But if you to go in and confess your sins to some man as though he could forgive you, that's a stupid thing to do, and I don't care whether you like it or not. you got no Bible for it. Not an ounce of Bible for it. The Bible tells exactly what to confess our sins to God. And every true born again believer can confess his sins to God. Don't confess it to some man. Confess it to God. The less you can keep away from the devil, the less he'll know about you. A lot of people get up and confess a whole bunch of junk to the church. And that's good the devil wants. Then the devil knows about it and everybody else. Go into your closet. Tell God about it. There's some things you don't need to confess to any man. There's some things you don't need to let the devil know about. You go in your closet, shut that door, and you tell God about it. It's not the devil's business what you tell God. And it's nobody else's business what you tell God. And you tell God all about it, and somebody else asks you what it's all about, it's none of their business, you settle that with God. Because it is none of their business. And you don't have to go and confess it to anybody. The blood of Jesus Christ will cleanse your conscience from dead works. A lot of these people run to these men confessing their sins and pouring out a lot of stuff to them and telling the things that happened between him, her and her husband and uh, he, she, and, he, she and his wife and tell the, uh, the, the, old, the preacher all that kind of junk. You're foolish. You're foolish. You're foolish. That preacher can't forgive you your sins. God Almighty is the one to do that. You can say, now, Lord, uh, you tell your preacher to pray with you about a problem. You have a problem. 
And uh, you don't have to tell him what it is. None of his business. You just tell God about it. And if he's the right kind of preacher, he won't try to find out what it is. He'll just pray that God will solve your problem. That's what it ought to be. And so the blood of Christ cleanses from all sin. Number six, the church is bought with the blood. Acts chapter 20, verse 28, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and all the flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you over sins, to feed the church of God, which is purchased with his own blood. God bought the church, and he bought it with his own blood. This church has been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. You have been purchased by the blood of the Lamb. You belong to God. We are redeemed with that precious blood, Simon and Peter said. First Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. And then after that, you can sing a new song. Thy worthy to take the book and open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by the blood of every, of every kindred tongue, people, and nation. So you can praise God and sing about the blood. Then number seven, the blood of Christ gives us power to enter into his presence. I won't have time to enlarge upon that, but read Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 19. Then finally, the blood of Christ gives us the right to enter the gate of the city and partake of the tree of life. Revelation chapter 7, verse 14, Revelation chapter 22, and verse 14. You ought to read that. Cogitate upon it. Search it out. Let it become part of you. And you ought to thank God for the blood. And you ought to sing more about the blood. And every church ought to sing more about the blood. And you can't find songs any greater than those that have something about the blood in them. And we just need to sing about it and praise God about that. Now let me tell you this and I close. There was a little girl one time. Her daddy wouldn't let her go to church. And she never got a chance to go to church. And she passed by a little tent meeting one night. And her heart was so heavy. And she wanted to go in. The singing sounds so good. And she went in. And so they, they, she went in and, and went out and got saved. When she came home, her daddy told her, said, Don't you ever, ever, ever put your foot back in a place like that again. Do I beat you half to death? And so a little later she passed by that tent and her little heart was so hungry. She wanted to go in and hear the preacher preach. And she went in. And when she got home, the daddy said, Did you stop by that tent? Yes, the daddy, I was coming by and I, I, I just, I just wanted to go in and hear the preaching and hear the singing. I, I'd like to hear it so much. He took her in a room and he beat her almost to death. He tore her dress with the, the hickory or whip or whatever he used. He beat her back. He had blood running down her back and her arms and all over her little dress. And, uh, the story goes that from that, uh, she contracted, uh, pneumonia and began to get, uh, uh, sinking real low and getting close to eternity. And just before she died, she said, Mama, it is my dress that I had on when Daddy whipped me? Said, is, is it here? She said, Yes, darling, it's here. Said, Mama, can I have it? Yes, you may. She brought the little dress to her and she hugged it to her bosom. Mama said, Honey, what do you want with it? Said, The preacher said the other night that they beat Jesus and had blood on him and there's blood on him. And said, uh, they beat him for me and he beat him in my place and beat the blood out of him and said, Mom, I want to take this with me to heaven and show Jesus that my blood had been beat because I love him, because I accepted him as my savior. She hugged the low bloody dress to her bosom and went on to be with God. Let's stand up. Thank God for the power of the blood. Father in heaven, I pray that you'll use the message May the blood of Jesus Christ cleanse them all sin. Speak to every heart. If anybody in this auditorium unsaved and not right with thee, may this be the day when they'll come to know thee. Use the message not only to this people here, but use it to those out in the radio listening audience. In Christ's name, amen. Debbie, you play us something on the instrument. and We'll help you if you need it. If you need salvation, if you need rededication, if you need church membership, if you need something, we'll help you. That's why we're giving this invitation. You feel free to come. We're not trying to put anybody on the spot. We want to help you. Would you come? Why we wait?
Oh, 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 oh,